I feel like uh, I should probably apologize for what I'm about to do to you before I do it. Um, but I won't because it'll be great. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask, um, all right, this ain't going to work. Let me just uh, get my gear together a bit here. Um, I'll, I'll ask you guys, uh, I'm going to play a little song on guitar, just a little bit of one, and I'll ask you guys to help me out by uh, singing the lyrics. Uh, and to encourage, if you know the song, of course, and to encourage you to do that, uh, I'll sing the lyrics. Uh, and you'll quickly realize probably that whatever the quality of your own voice, it's better than listening to mine. So, uh, yeah, let's do that. Uh, I'll just turn off my tuner, and we'll be set. All right. You guys ready? Here we go. Okay, here we go. We don't need no education. Join in. <laughs> we don't need no thoughts control. No dark sarcasm in the classroom. Teacher, leave them kids alone. This is where I always fall apart, so I'm just going to stop here. Um, well, yeah, the, the point's been made. Um, so the reason I did that, um, the reason I want to do that, is my talk today, I want to talk to you about education. Uh, but I want to do so uh, by referencing both that song and this guitar, um, and weave them together in what I hope will be an interesting way about how we could potentially enhance some of what we do in the classroom. So let's start with the song. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that song came off the album The Wall uh, by Pink Floyd, 1979. Uh, and it's an album that depicts the gradual descent of the founding member of Pink Floyd, Sid Barrett, the gradual descent of him into insanity. Uh, basically, the building of a wall between him and sanity. And uh, the author of all the songs, Roger Waters, describes the various bricks in the wall, the various things that drove him insane. And one of those bricks that's featured very highly in that song is the public education system. The public education system helped drive Sid Barrett insane. Uh, well, that seems a little strong, uh, and I believe it is a little strong, but if you listen to the words of that song, the we don't need no education, we don't need no dark sarcasm in the classroom, teachers, leave those kids alone. He's describing the education system as a very oppressive kind of system, a system where students are lorded over and, and told what to do. And in fact, in the video of that song, he has students on a conveyor belt being dropped into a giant meat grinder and coming out as hamburger on the other end. Um, well, let me first say, as a professor of University of Toronto, I think it's a little extreme. Um, I think the public education system does a little better than that. In fact, I want to you know, proudly stand up here and say, we do need no education. No, wait a minute. We do, we do need an education. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, and, and in fact, the public education system does relatively well. Uh, it got me where I am. But I do think there's something to learn from that song um, and something that does ring true. It certainly rang true to me when, as a 14-year-old when I first heard that song. And that's the notion that Sometimes, something about the way we educate students can kind of suck the fun out of learning. Okay, so I went to school, uh, as we all did, and I learned. Uh, but I went to school primarily for two reasons. One, my friends were there, uh, and two, my dad would kick my ass if I didn't. Uh, that's a nice motivation if you ever need one. Um, so, you know, I went to school and I did learn, but the learning I would almost describe as uphill learning. You know, I kind of learned despite the system. It wasn't that I was eating every new piece of information up. I was kind of digesting them somehow intravenously through a, a drip that the system had put into my arm, uh, which is fine. But if we could ever capture that really excited learning, that really the, the kind of learning that a, that a student embraces, then that would be great, even if we could add some pockets of it. And so that brings me to this guitar. This guitar, by the way, is named Mr. Hyde. You can see I burned that into him. Um, not very nice, but it's Mr. Hyde. He's supposed to be a little ugly. Um, this is what's called a project guitar. And what a project guitar is, it's a guitar that guitarists build or repair, and they do so for two reasons. 
One, either, well, one, to have an instrument at the end so that we can stand up in front of you and we can, you know, look with pride and go, see this, this monkey built his own tool. This is my tool and my tool works. It sounds all right. And I did it. Uh, and that's cool. Uh, but the other reason is because we want to learn about guitars. We want to appreciate our instrument. Just like, you know, someone who's a really avid uh, driver wants to understand the machinery of the car. Um, a good guitarist usually wants to understand how the guitar actually works. And the best way to understand anything is to build it. Right? Put it together part by part and think of each part. Uh, and so that's what this guitar is. It's a project guitar that I put together. Um, it started with this body, which was in fact just blank wood. It wasn't finished at all. It was, it was cut out. Uh, I was actually in the 12th fret downtown with, uh, with $100 burning in my pocket. I know we're supposed to save money, but it was burning in my pocket. It was $100 that my mom gave me for my birthday. And I like to, this is my excuse actually, I like to show my mom what I bought with the money she gave me for the birthday. I don't just want it to disappear somewhere. I, I like to show her something. So I bought this guitar. I saw it. It looks like a Strat, which is what Jimi Hendrix plays, but it's made out of mahogany which is more like a Les Paul, what Jimmy Page plays. And that fascinated me. I'd never heard of a mahogany strap before. So I bought it, went home, called mom, and I said, hey mom, um, I, I bought something with the, with the present, with the money you sent. I bought this guitar body, but what you really gave me for my birthday is not so much the guitar body, but the learning experience that will now ensue. Okay, I, because I plan on building a functioning guitar out of this body, and I know I will really enjoy that. Uh, so thank you, and thank you, Mom. Uh, if you're watching, I love you very much. Um, I, well, we all love our moms, right? Um, all right, so uh, at any rate, uh, let me skip to the end of the story because one of the points I want to stress today is that the end of the process can determine, at times, the way the process unfolds. So I'm going to jump now to December 12th. So I, I bought the guitar body in August, around the time of my birthday. Now, December 12th, 2012, uh, it was a new moon. I know all this because my wife has sort of pagan leanings, like real leanings, kind of. And so when it's 12, 12, 12 and a new moon, that's a good day to do something cool. Uh, and so I basically, I had two wires left to solder, these two wires left to solder in this guitar, uh, and then it was going to be done. And that's a fascinating point in the process because while you're building one of these, you have no idea what, whether what you're doing every step of the way will matter. What, what, could you be screwing something up? Could it be the case that when I connect the final wires and plug it in, nothing happens? Or maybe it'll sound really horrible. You don't know. Um, so on that night, December 12th, did the last soldering. Um, I, and I remember my wife had the, the cell phone up. She said she was going to take a video. I turned it on, stood in front. I just added a little bit of dirt to make it a real Mr. Hyde. Uh, and I remember standing in front of the camera and doing something like... I felt so good. I felt so good because it worked and it sounded pretty good. It needs some tweaking. It still needs some tweaking, but it actually sounded all right. And so, I, in fact, I felt so good that I posted that video on Facebook, which you know, I know for most people, like, big deal, you post on Facebook. I've posted three things on Facebook, okay? <laughs> one of the other things is my less than one year old granddaughter playing drums with two hands. Um, that's pretty cool. That's Facebook worthy. And for me, this was Facebook worthy. So the reason I'm stressing that is because although that became reality on that night, that was fantasy for the four months prior. And that fantasy, that fantasy of building something that would have value, of something that I would be proud of, I think changed the whole learning process in some critical ways. And I can only highlight a couple with the time we have. So I want to highlight the way I interacted with information and the way I interacted with what I could loosely call teachers or knowledge holders. So as far as interaction, let's just take these things right here. These things are called pickups. Uh, they are what turn the vibration of strings into an electrical signal. Now it turns out there are tons of different kinds of pickups with different magnets, with different numbers of coil wraps, with I could go on and on. I, I could tell you so much about pickups, you would be shocked. Why? How did I come to all this knowledge? Because I wanted to put the right pickups in this guitar. I wanted, I wanted it to be good. It mattered to me. It really mattered to me. So 
I would look on Kijiji or eBay, and I would find what pickups are available, um, who's selling, and then I would begin self-directed research. Think of that. Teachers, leave them kids alone. I was left alone. Okay? And I would go and I would do websites and I would do YouTube videos, whatever I could do to find out about the different pickups. And then eventually I chose a set and I went to buy them. Now when I went to buy them, I interacted with somebody who had already been where I am going. Okay? They were selling parts of guitars, which invariably meant they had also built guitars. Um, and when I interacted with these people, I knew that. And I wanted their information. Um, when I interacted with them, I was part of my goal was to chat with them and find out what they knew and find out what I could learn because, of course, the other part of the process I was going through wasn't just learning about pickups, but I ultimately wanted to mount them, so I had to learn how to actually do things. Um, and, and that was a very important thing that other people knew. I could learn a little bit about that on the web, but the real reality of how to do it right, you learn from other humans with experience. So I was very much you know, into that part of the process as well. Uh, and I enjoyed it all. And the reason I think I enjoyed it so much and the reason I was so hungry for the knowledge was because I cared about the final product. Okay, so now let me emphasize this with another story. Uh, at one point, my wife and I went to Memphis. Um, Check, you know, to take in the music and the blues and that kind of thing. But while we were in Memphis, we also uh, went to the Gibson Guitar Factory. Uh, and that was my first time actually seeing guitars made and built. And they toured us all around and they showed us the various machines and, and the crafts that people were doing. And it was all fascinating. But there was this one machine in the corner. It was this big ominous looking machine and it had a rack of guitars by it. At one point I asked the tour guy, well, what about that machine? You're not talking about that machine. And he was like, oh. Well, hush tones. We don't usually talk about that machine on tours because it tends to disturb people. It's disturb people. And he's like, okay, okay, here, here's the story. Um, Gibson has very high quality standards, extremely high quality standards. No guitar, I know there's no perfect, but no guitar can leave our factory until it's pretty darn close to perfect. And if we find a flaw in the final inspection of any sort, the flawed guitar ends up on that rack and they all look like perfectly good guitars to us in the tour. And then at night, when there's no tours, no one's around, we turn on that little machine and we throw the guitars in it because it's a guitar chipper. <laughs> Sorry, that was, that was some scary sound. Um, it, it basically chips the guitars up and throws them away. Okay, So let's imagine the following. First of all, I don't know who created that machine. It's some horrible engineer out there somewhere. Um, but let's imagine that the guitar learning process were changed now and made more formal. Let's imagine I was in a class with 49 other students and we were given a body of a guitar and we were told by the instructor, your task is to build a working, functional guitar. But here's the trick. When you're all done, um, I'm going to line up all your guitars as a professor and of course I'm going to be tired and uh, it's all the overworked, blah, 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 blah. And I'm going to go through these guitars one at a time and I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to play it a little bit. Try a few things out with it, see how it sounds, give you a mark, throw the guitar into the shredder. <laughs> it's gone. Okay, once you're done doing all the work, once you build this guitar and I give it a mark, I throw it in the shredder. That's how it's going to work. Now go ahead and build your guitar. How does that change everything? Do I care so much about all the details, about all the quality? Will my classmates care? If I get the sense they don't care that much, then really the goal now is just to get a mark. It's not to produce a guitar anymore. Um, and so really all I need to do is be roughly at the same level as my peers, maybe a little better. That'll probably get me a good enough mark. And I don't really care about creating the perfect guitar. In fact, maybe I could find somebody else who could build the guitar for me, and I could submit it, and I would get a great mark. And that's all fine because I don't really care about the final product and maybe I don't even care about the learning process anymore, which is really the critical point. That we in the public education system often use assessments like that are very similar in some ways to that guitar shredder example. We ask students to create an essay or to work through some problem set or to do a case in, in a business course and, and do all this stuff. But ultimately, every student knows that all of their work is not going anywhere. 
It's just a hoop. They're being asked to jump through so that they can be marked, and that's it. And then we as educators are sometimes depressed because students aren't into it. They're not getting it. They're not engaged. And engagement is the front door to learning. But I think that's partly why. So then the question becomes, well, can we do anything about it? Well, there are things like co-op programs, obviously, experiential learning, big thing here at UT Scarborough. I can tell you the students who put on this conference, I bet they learned so much uh, because this conference mattered to them. Same process as building a guitar. Those are all good, but I think we can also bring some into the more traditional classroom. And here's one example. Uh, at UT Scarborough in last summer, we mounted a new course called Wiki Scholar. The idea here is students would come in in groups, and um, they were asked, it was in the context of psychology, so they were asked to think of the psychology topics they knew a little bit about, go to Wikipedia, and try to see if they could find a topic that was either had no page at all, or had a very underdeveloped page, like just a stub. And now their task was to learn everything they could about that phenomenon, to work together to organize that knowledge, and to ultimately build a Wikipedia page, um, and then ultimately, of course, to go live with that page. So everything is kind of like the essay until you get to the go live, because when you get to the go live, open access to knowledge, you are now a student, who's learned a bunch of information and you're sharing it with the world. Does the world care? You're darn right they care. If you look at almost any Wikipedia page, it'll get hundreds if not thousands of hits a day. Immediately, others start interacting with their students, consuming their knowledge, sometimes ripping what they did off and telling them they have to change things. But immediately, it's out there in the real world and it's having a real impact. The students know that they are bringing knowledge to the world and sharing it with the world. Do they feel it? Well, here's one quote from a student. She said, I used to wake up at 3 in the morning to check my Facebook page. Now I wake up at 3 in the morning to check my Wikipedia article. Um, that was literally the sort of level of, of addiction. And, and as, a, as a professor of the course, I could feel that as well. You know, I could very much feel the buzz in the course and it was a joy. And quite honestly, this teacher largely left the kids alone. Other than supervising, I let them do their thing, and it was a really kind of cool vibe. So I think that's a good example of how technology can enable this kind of uh, experience. So of course, my big punchline is just then, we should bring in more of this when we can and where we can. We can't do it all the time, but to the extent we can do it, we should bring it in. It'll enable a better learning experience for our students, and most importantly, we will not drive any more of them insane, which is very important. So, thank you.